the, the founding includes, in addition to that kind of Enlightenment Jeffersonian strand, it includes um, a Puritan strain, um, which is is uh, you know obviously much more attentive to the things of God. It takes a um, it's always too dark a view of human being as a Catholic. I mean, uh, it's more Calvinist than 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 the, the um, you know uh, account of of the human person than than the one I share. But nevertheless, it 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 sees this new republic as um, uh, uh, as having a kind of moral duty and destiny. And you see that, especially, for example, in, in a John Adams, who famously says, you know, our, um, our constitution is only fit from a, for a moral and, and, uh, and religious people. Um, and um, the, the corollary to that is that if you don't have such a people, um, in fact, rights talk and a, and a rights-based system such as ours can produce a very monstrous regime. Um, um, so there is that religious element. There is... Um, you know, there's a kind of Sabbatarian tradition in the United States, which I think is interesting, and again, makes it um, makes it so that the founding isn't nearly as libertarian as our libertarian friends would retcon it to be. Um, so, you know, we've had a Sabbatarian tradition, the idea that the law should uphold one day a week um, for rest, for recreation, for family time, for the things of God. We've had that going back to before there was a republic. The New England, obviously, colonies had that. Uh, they were the Puritan one. But even the supposedly more secular um, Virginia and New Amsterdam, they also had a Sabbatarian. Um, the law upheld Sunday. And, you know, the Sabbatarianism really didn't go away until, um, you know, in begin into the 20, 20th century. And the last sort of statewide blue law was only abolished, as I point out in the book, in, in 2019. So um, our, our libertarians basically would have to look at that and say, well, I guess, I guess our grandfathers were just uh, living in a totalitarian state, which is, of course, you know, just because it took Sunday off doesn't mean they were unfree. They just thought that, you know, that, that working people need rest and it's good for society to order one day to, to contemplation and scripture. That doesn't make them authoritarians or whatever. Um, so... You know, I, I should also note we've we've always had uh, common law obscenity laws in this country since before the founding. We've had federal obscenity laws, which are still on the book. Um, all of these, we we had you know blasphemy convictions into the 19th century. So what I'm saying is that um, the totality of the picture you get from American history is not as as our libertarians friends. Uh, Painted that is that like this kind of uber libertarian secular <laughs> republic. It wasn't that. I mean, it, religion was so interwoven into the language of of uh, statecraft in the 18th, 19th century. Um, you know, when we go to civil war, you know, Lincoln cannot but couch it in in the terms of you know uh, of the Old Testament. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, the the point I'm trying to make here is that. Um, Yes, we, we do have um, this one strand of the founding, which is um, very much tied to the European Enlightenment. And I think some of our troubles can be traced back to it. But as a research of today, we also have lots of other strands of the founding that uh, create a more complicated picture of what, what this country is historically. The only other point I would make is that um, as a conservative operator, I do, much much less so than our Claremont friends, I don't kind of constantly ask what would the founders do, you know, like it's just sort of like, I don't know, I'll be honest, I mean, I'll speak very frankly, I mean, I yeah. ultimately, I, 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 I find, you know, I find Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas a lot richer and more interesting as than I do uh, than I do many of the founders, let's put it that way. And, um, you know, I, I, I just see a, a sort of um, obsession with recreating the kind of true American regime, what it was meant to be, 
um, is is kind of uh, it's 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 nostalgia. It's it's a you know it is what it is. What we have. have I, I, I find it annoying when people say, you know, let no, no, this, this, what we have is just, it's a total distortion of what it was. At some point you have to say, look, you know, I, consequences can be traced back to founding ideas and founding mythologies. And um, we are where we are. So let's, let's try to think, how can we fix it? And if the, if the founding gives us resources, for fixing where we are, which I think you would agree we're in, in some kind of nadir, then great, let's tap into those resources of the founding. But if it doesn't, I'm kind of obsessively focus on the founding as a resource. I have had all kinds of people on this show from Alexander Dugan to Bronze Age Pervert to yourself to Ryan Williams, president of Claremont, to Michael Anton, to Curtis Yarvin. I don't always challenge everything that everyone says that I disagree with. And this is going to be one of those cases as well, too. The point here is to get these ideas out, to talk about them, let people get to know you and your position. Uh, so let's just continue with, I have one comment on that. Um, I have been recently reading sermons from mid 18th century rural America. Mm -hmm. put together in a collection with the title called Our Religious Revolution. And there were certainly people in the new land who thought they were in a Zion, new Zion, sent there by God to recreate God's kingdom, extremely traditional, extremely tied to their religion and spirituality, who partnered with the cosmopolitans, <laughs> to use a loaded term, mm -hmm. uh, of the time, uh, in order to secure that liberty, that religious liberty that they wanted in order to pursue what they understood was their calling and their vision. And that history, that legacy is still with us in the United States. And I wonder, I wonder in the book you wrote, we need a new true meaning of the land of the free. And you also, I believe, wrote that a free America, or maybe I'm asking you this question, is the free America as we stand today in practice degrading to this human spirit, human spirit, that those religious types, the, the sermons I'm referring to, the, that, that they were seeking, right? Is our freedom now degrading to the human spirit that they sought freedom to enjoy? Right? This is a paradox that I, or maybe it's not a paradox. This is a, a difficult question for me to ponder. I don't necessarily have the answer. And from here, I would like to begin to segue into potential solutions uh, to these issues from your problem, but uh, that you presented, but what could you expand on that new true meaning to the land of the free is America in practice today, degrading to the human spirit that, these the religious folks in 18th century wanted the freedom to pursue it's a it seems yeah. like a, a different difficult square to circle or whatever phrase you want to use here yeah I'm, I, I, I I think it is I mean I, I, the, way, the way the thing that I the mantra I always promote these days is it's just um, look look around you um, look at for example of the degree to which, um, let's say, the rainbow ideology, beginning as a, a movement of kind of marginalized people just seeking tolerance, um, I have using the kind of classic American language of rights, has now become this kind of oppressive force where the you know the uh, you you have to in order to adhere to the rainbow ideology, which by the way, the rainbow itself, its um, colors constantly change now. They have attached other, other rainbows to the rainbow in this kind of clashing horrible way, just from an aesthetic point of view. But anyway, um, um, you have to, it, it, it forces Americans to voice untruths. It forces them to say, uh, you know, like uh, that there are, uh, uh, there are, 157 genders that uh, um, uh, that uh, that a man can menstruate, um, that a man can have babies. Um, 
I mean, look at the imagery that that is so they, that they constantly push with that. By the way, of like, you know, it's just obvious. It's just a woman obviously taking hormones and therefore has a beard and they'll like have a baby. There's something very kind of deliberately profane in how they go about doing this. And the United States not only is now in its disordered concept of freedom, um, degrading the freedom of those 18th century um, preachers you were talking about, but is also exporting this to every corner of the globe and through its foreign policy apparatus, through its non-governmental organizations, through its um, international development aid. If you don't, you know, every, every country has to move toward this same path of, of um, you know, disordered liberalism that we have. And if they don't, then they get, they get demonized like Hungary. Um, they get treated like uh, um, second class nations in the global community. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, so I, my basic point is that I agree with you. I think that um, what we have today degrades the idea of freedom that um, this country's, you know, deeply religious uh, kind of founding generation aspired after. And it's kind of an academic debate, and I don't want to get into it further, to what degree the disorders that we see today are can be traced back to a particular kind of 18th century way of seeing the world or not. I mean, and, and various theological kind of positions, could they possibly re lead to the, to the present moment? And then at some point, these disagreements, be, again, become very academic, but the bottom line is that this is what we face. And uh, I think uh, anyone who still has some sense of natural law, as much as it's been beaten out of us, looks at some of this stuff and says, no, this is, this is grotesque. This is, this is wrong, and it's being celebrated. It's being shoved down our throats. Definitely. Uh, I am of the opinion that um, that movement is a, a Trojan horse. It is a, a tool. It's a foot soldier of something larger that's meant to be divisive. And the trans situation is, is, is just the latest battlefront in a trend of destroying barriers, right? The, the idea here is to destroy all barriers, all differences, we become nothing. If we're nothing, then we can be controlled and manipulated in whatever way they, totally. want, they want for us. And Absolutely. And, and so one of the themes that I have been hammering on over the last couple of years is that we had a generation or more of um, indiscriminate expansion, indiscriminate connection, indiscriminate reaching out and growing and connecting which has led actually to a contamination of our, of our society and, and the obliteration of barriers. And what we need is a strategic disconnection, the establishment of barriers, barriers that we decide uh, who comes, who goes, what goes, what comes, uh, and take more control over it. And, and we find this, this permeability in nature, in, in biology, we find it in, in computer science, we find it and all, all around us, we find barriers. <laughs> and partly it's a fail safe system to make sure that if we have one failure over here, it's not systemic. Uh, and so uh, I can see this trend in so many things in social media, the, the, the indiscriminate expansion and, uh, and, and expression of self, like we don't need, we don't need all of that. Uh, we've seen it with the expansion. It's quite all right. We all have family and everything. It's all good, man. My dog will start barking in just a second. This isn't MSNBC, even though we do better numbers. Okay. Um, we, we've seen that with the expansion of, of NATO. We've seen that with the expansion of world trade, like indiscriminate expansion with no regard to barriers and no regard to control. We see that with immigration. We see it with all kinds of stuff.